Good afternoon. We are now ready to begin our discussion of xenographs, can we, should we? As you can tell from this title of this particular session of our Medical Ethics Grand Rounds, this afternoon we are concerned with the question of cross-species transplantation, and we're trying to explore both sides of that particular issue. On the one hand, we'd like to know what can be done technically along this line at this time in human history. And on the other hand, we'd like to know what ought to be done from a moral point of view. We have two persons who are very well qualified to lead us in this discussion. We will hear first from Dr. Leonard Bailey, who is the chairman of the Department of Surgery here in the School of Medicine at Loma Linda University, and is well known throughout the world for his leadership in organ transplantation in general, and for his great interest in cross-species transplantation in particular. Dr. Bailey, of course, uh, was well known because of the 1984 baby Fay surgery, which involved the heart of a primate. We will then hear from Dr. Dennis de Leon, a physician who was educated at the University of Tennessee in his undergraduate years and in his medical school training, and is now at the University of Chicago doing a fellowship in clinical ethics. Dr. De Leon is back in Loma Linda for this and some related occasions, so we're delighted that you came all the way from Chicago for this, Dennis. We will hear from him secondly, then we hope to have time for conversation with the group. So join me in welcoming Dr. Bailey to this discussion. Thank you. I get to hold that. Well, uh, good afternoon. There are about 200 things we could talk about this morning, but I can't talk about all those. I'd like to tell you about the liver transplant experience in Pittsburgh. Uh, you should know, though, from that experience that after 71 uh, days, that liver didn't reject. And so a lot of things were done right at Pittsburgh in their cross-species project. They have another one brewing right now, and we'll see how that turns out, because I think they will have learned a good deal from their mistakes. Uh, we could talk about the Somalians, because the last thing on their mind is xenotransplantation today, <laughs> just to put it all in perspective. Uh, but we've come together to sort of discuss uh, an area of uh, focused interest uh, that uh, we've had here for a number of years, and that is uh, newborn cross-species transplantation and where that might fit in uh, to today's pattern, if it does, indeed. And so we'll start right out with some slides and turn the lights down and off and all that sort of thing. Surgeons can't uh, function without multimedia, and so the real meat of what you're going to hear will come from Dr. Delion. I'm just going to entertain you for a little while and see if it makes any sense uh, to you. Uh, first thing that occurs to me is why bother do any of this? Uh, there are a lot more important things we could do. I understand you could immunize half of Los Angeles for what it takes to do one liver transplant down there. And so why do we spend our money this way? And there are perhaps several uh, reasons that at least come to mind to the surgeon. One is that uh, most parents, if they have a baby, wish the baby to live. And so we're going to continue to focus then on the baby picture. It, to me, it's intuitively correct. That's uh, self-explanatory. Uh, it has to do with preservation of the human species, at least we hope it does, as opposed to other forms of life, uh, that the quality of life after transplantation of solid organs is really quite excellent, that it may be cost-effective therapy in relation to other forms of available therapy, that uh, it makes a global statement for good. Now, maybe I'm going a little broad there, but I think it does. Every time a baby starves to death in Somalia, if we can save one of the babies here, at least in global terms, it's a statement for what could be, what can be. It offers promise. And finally, if you were to ask the baby himself, he'd probably prefer to live. Now, maybe he'd pop out in Somalia and look around and decide otherwise. Or I'm just picking on Somalia. Uh, it could be that he could pop out in San Bernardino and look around and and choose otherwise. But in general, we would think that the baby might want to live. It's a fair assumption. We know from our experience in dealing with baby transplants that if they survive the operation, they're likely to live at least out to five years. It's one of the most dramatic curves in solid organ transplantation in that it's horizontal. Most curves in transplantation, as you know, uh, have drift off. They continue to drift off until everybody's gone. Uh, that isn't true in the baby business, at least we don't think it'll be true in the baby business. And it compares quite favorably with other things we do. 
uh, besides transplantation. If you rank neonatal heart transplantation with repair of tetralogy of flow, an ordinary congenital heart defect uh, done in the newborn period or even just an arch repair, aortic arch repair, or some of these other dreadful things and rank those uh, in terms of outcome at five years with neonatal transplantation, neonatal transplantation wins. It's a better form of therapy any way you cut it. There are very few things that compete favorably with it, in fact, that we do in any of our work in open heart surgery and newborn period. So that's part of the basis of the argument. Finally, um, there are not enough donors, and that's why we're here meeting together like this today. Because there aren't enough donors, then we have to, we have to devise ways to enhance donor resources. And there are a number of ways to do that, and our laboratory has been vigorous in investigating several of those ways. Uh, my colleagues and I have been uh, uh, working in the area of, of uh, reviving dead hearts and using those uh, as uh, donated organs. Kind of interesting. You could have a whole other session here talking about when life stops because those uh, babies whose hearts stop and they're pronounced dead may still be useful heart organ donors and other organ donors for maybe up to 30 or 40 minutes after that. Uh, so you sort of die by degrees, and the important part of you probably dies quickest, pleasantly, so that some of those other decisions can be made. That's one way to enhance donors. Another way is to reach into the species uh, that are different than our own and to the animal kingdom and decide if uh, those organs are useful. And so this monograph points out that historically man has wondered about cross-species transplantation in a number of different ways. And I'll let you decide about some of these uh, uh, pictures as to whether you think that's true. Now, these are all taken from that wonderful uh, monograph on xenotransplantation. We probably won't get to some of these, but uh, <laughs> we may be able to get to heart transplantation. Even the commercial folks have got into this oranges and apples business pretty uh, intensely as one of the advertisements for pacemakers. <laughs> That's really xenotransplantation in its uh, purest form. And we've been investigating this now for a number of years down in the laboratory, and I've had a lot of help with that. And I could mention a lot of names of people that have taken the ball and run and are doing really well in helping us get at some of these answers. Suffice it to say, when we put little goat hearts and little goats, they would live indefinitely with a minimum of immunosuppression. We, our, our notions about the neonatal or the newborn immune system were rather confirmed by the experience in the laboratory. You could have your heart transplant as newborn, you could grow up, you could give birth to multiple other babies, and they would turn out normally, and you could grow old and you could exercise and do all the other things little goats do on the farm. Um, then when we put lamb hearts in goats, uh, that is cross-species transplantation, and we got survival out to nearly six months with very modest immunosuppression in those early days. Interestingly enough, we put some pig hearts into goats and we got survival out to a month with that, and you wouldn't predict from the bench at least that you'd get anywhere with that uh, arrangement. And so there may be something to think about uh, in that regard. Um, well, this is an interesting facility that we have here at Loma Linda, and I'm not gonna let you look at the rear ends of little goats for the very long, except to tell you that they all have lamb hearts in them, and so they're an interesting lot of goats worth contemplating. Cross-species transplantation, in my view, Dr. Delian, would be useful if we can prove the clinical efficacy. Until we get a chance to do that, we won't be able to solve some of these problems. And if, if solid organ transplantation really had waited for this sort of discussion, uh, we probably still wouldn't be doing solid organ transplantations, quite frankly, although this sort of discussion is very healthy. But I don't know that uh, our discussions, particularly the armchair discussions, need to necessarily interrupt the medical progress as it's likely to happen. Keep that in mind, too, as we proceed along. Well, xenotransplantation is based on these kinds of things, at least from our perspective. The privileged uh, milieu of the newborn, the uh, pre-transplant immunologic selection, which the Pittsburgh group are taking advantage of in their liver program. That never existed before 1984 when Dr. Sandy Nelson Canarella came on and helped us understand how we might actually select subhuman species for humans. Look at those things which are common uh, uh, between the species. The barriers have to do with immunology uh, and to some degree uh, philosophy and sociology and you're going to deal in some of those areas I think. But let's deal with immunology first of all. We looked at a number of different ways at, at testing uh, 
baboon, potential baboon donors as, as organ donors for humans. Uh, and isolated perfusion studies and some of these other bench assays to see how we uh, shape up with the baboon population. If you take a goat heart and put it in isolated perfusion uh, bath with human blood going through its vessels, uh, you'll find that the uh, heart uh, in just a few moments will seize up and won't function. That probably has nothing to do with immunology. It may have something to do though with rheology, with mechanics of blood flow. Uh, uh, it turns out goats have red cells that are three microns across. Yours and mine are seven or eight or ten microns, and we probably can't run our blood through goat vessels. That's what that's telling us. So goats and ruminants probably wouldn't be a very good match for human beings, even though it's been tried, to my knowledge, twice in human history. However, if you take a baboon heart or uh, any other sort of primate heart and put it in the same isolated preparation with human blood running through its vessels, It'll function beautifully for the duration of the experiment. Now, it can't go on indefinitely in this system, but for up to 12 hours, you could take that heart then and take it out and transplant it in a recipient, and it would work fine. And so we want to look at those things where we have similarity, and if we are very similar to the donor, regardless of species, uh, it's likely that, that that organ transplant is going to work. If we're terribly dissimilar, from a histocompatibility point of view and a, and a red cell immunology point of view, then chances are that patient in that graft isn't going to work. And uh, this is where Dr. Canarello has helped me understand things a little bit better, and she can straighten me out if I say something wrong. She's sitting right here. But what we're going to look for in, in uh, recipients is whether or not they have a preformed antibody, typical pentamere that you see up there in the corner, that would, um, that would attack a graft immediately and do it in. And in the newborn world, there is no preformed antibody against baboon in general. Uh, also, we want to see how similar they are in terms of their histocompatibility. And on the short arm here of the sixth chromosome is what makes you different from the person beside you or from the baboon species. And uh, we've discovered in our laboratories here that we share specificities with baboons about a third of the time. And the key is to try to find those baboons that have like specificities with the human recipient that's intended. And that way it can be a selective process. And more importantly, and when you put cells from baboons and humans together and let one respond to the other in a mixed lymphocyte uh, culture, and then uh, let them respond and add a little uh, uh, tritiated thymid into it, and then count the response, the level of response indicates how similar those cells are to one another. And so if you get a very soft response, even in a two-way system, uh, that's a pretty good uh, and a pretty clever way to select uh, a donor. We don't have this ability in the world of heart transplantation among allografts. We have to use whatever comes down the pike in the allografts, completely random. Some of them are terrible matches. You wouldn't predict they'd even survive, and yet they kind of do uh, with a lot of manipulation. Uh, this way, we'd be able to actually select them. And my hunch is that in time, we'll find that a well-selected subhuman primate donor would be better than a randomly selected allograft. When we did baby Fay, we talked ourselves into crossing the ABO barrier based on this kind of uh, argument uh, and a dying baby. And uh, that's probably, uh, at least we think, that's where we went wrong. This uh, little uh, donor, a one-year-old baboon, female baboon, gave up uh, her heart for this baby. They, and she taught us a lot, a lot, and we'll talk more about her. She taught us how to cope with immediate response to that kind of reaction so that there is, there is a social sort of a psychological response to that endeavor that we've never quite uh, gotten over. There have been some wonderful cartoons that just depicted the ethics, perhaps, of what went on better than I can describe it for you, <laughs> but we're mainly interested in that group to the left. <laughs> And uh, then some people actually have it completely turned around, of course. They would rather we go the other direction. And I'll share that with you. Some just got irate and thought we were going to create an interesting species of our own. Some of us believe that that isn't possible. There was a memorial service, of course, for the baboons, and I don't mind that at all. I think that's wonderful. That's telling us something about how sensitive we need to be to the subhuman species. And a few people were just simply uh, outraged, like as if when fire was invented. <laughs> Quick, put it out. Here come some anti-fire demonstrators. <laughs> well, pretend xenotransplantation is fire. 
And then that puts you in that element a little bit there. Some people, of course, are just indifferent. We'll move along. <laughs> and, and those of us in the, in the milieu of all this, uh, of course, felt like this fellow. And this will sink in. Just keep thinking about that a little bit. Uh, but getting back to baby Faye, perhaps her greatest legacy was to prove to the world that a newborn baby could get a solid organ, a heart transplant, and survive. She did all that. She did it beautifully. And others, many others since then, have done it too. The uh, other legacy she left with us is that uh, she announced to the world that babies too need solid organs. And so people who have uh, fathered and mothered babies who unfortunately are dying, uh, brain death, need to be considering giving the baby's organs for, for donation. And we haven't done very well in that because the donor base for newborns and, and children is not very great. 25% of the people registered for transplantation at all ages die before they get an organ. And that's what xenotransplantation is about. Finally, I think this is the most profound ethical slide that I have in terms of cross-species transplantation and uh, the relative value of uh, man versus uh, subhuman uh, animal. What you need to take away from that experience in 1984 is the fact that baby Faye's response to that heart was exactly what you'd predict towards an allograft transplanted across a strong ABO barrier. Nothing else. And so we have room to improve there. We know how to select for the ABO too, and we can do that. And so we can make the next cross-species transplant a lot better than the last one, just as they're doing in Pittsburgh presently. Uh, one question we've had uh, since baby Faye is uh, if you were to... Uh, bridge an infant recipient with a baboon heart, would the baby develop uh, cross-reactive or some sort of species-specific antibody that would then preclude the subsequent ALA transplant? And with that, we'll show you a minute of video. Can you run that? Or maybe I can run it from here. I'll just play that thing. You're going to have to turn the lights way down or off to see the video. And there is a little sound to it, I think. I don't know whether you have sound with this or not. The uh, CBC people in Canada came down uh, in 1988 and made a nice, uh, how do you turn this off now? Baboons and other animals sacrificed for science. It's unfortunate, says Lynn Bailey, but saving human infants takes precedence. Since the death of baby Faye, he has carried out dozens of operations on baboons to try and perfect his technique. In this experiment, the surgical team has sacrificed one baboon for its healthy heart. That organ will be placed into a baboon that is now undergoing its second transplant operation. Then they plan to study the reaction of the animal's immune system. That, they say, is necessary because its blood system is amazingly close to that of a human. If the baboon does not reject its new heart and there are no complications, they say they will be confident they've solved their remaining problems and they'll be ready to recommend another animal-to-human transplant. The team here at Loma Linda is confident they are very close to another such operation. Stop that now. Uh, that was 1988. Uh, typical surgeon, right? <laughs> Well, I think we are very close now, and you can quote me on that if you like, because I think we're getting very, very close. <clears throat> the answer to that solution, and that had to do with that set of experiments where we, we put uh, xenografts in the neck, let them reject, let the antibodies come up, and then did allo transplants to see whether any harm would be done. And what we discovered was that the, uh, the recipient does develop the antibody, that it is cross-reactive, and that in fact it does no real harm, that we're able to carry out the secondary transplant without problem. And then uh, a couple of years ago, uh, some colleagues uh, uh, from Japan and our, and our own group here uh, put some uh, rhesus monkey hearts into infant baboons. That had never been done before. Now there had been cross-species primate transplants at Columbia and some other places. But to my knowledge, no one had ever put rhesus monkey hearts in infant baboons to try to get closer to what we're talking about here today. Well, that's Max. I'd like you to see Max in action. Turn those lights down again. 
it's worth taking a look at Max because Max is an historic animal and he's trying to tell you something. Uh, at, uh, at the time this film was taken, we were celebrating his uh, first year after having an orthotopically implanted rhesus monkey heart, which is about as close as we can get, I think, to baboons to humans. It's a selected uh, heart that was, immunologically selected heart that was put in. And this is Max a year later, doing what baboons do best. <laughs> and uh, we discovered six months later that he was probably able to eat around his medicine and stuff, and we got in trouble with him finally. Uh, those of you involved in primate research uh, will understand the difficulty in doing these kinds of experiments. Uh, just uh, in trying to maintain their perfect levels of immunosuppression and their surveillance for infection and all the other things. Max is one of several long-term survivors of, uh, of cross-species transplantation. Uh, that kind that we call concordant. Some of what we have in mind for baboons to babies. Well, Max then represents the real world of, uh, of surgical research where uh, he's a success story. Never in the history of the universe has any human thing or living thing gone on like Max for a year and a half with a cross-species organ in place. Although some probably have come close. And so Max went on to live 502 days, we believe, with that kind of information uh, that we can get babies at least bridged to an allo transplant with uh, subhuman primates. More interestingly, perhaps, is last year Dr. Gundry and, and uh, 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 our research group uh, uh, went about doing cross-species transplantation and more infant baboons, and this is one of them. What's unique about this is this this little infant baboon's alive with a piglet heart in his chest. And we found that you could get survival uh, out to beyond two weeks, even with a piglet heart. Now that's a real strong mismatch, and it took some interesting maneuvers to absorb antibody out of the recipient in order to get that far. But I think this early research in very discordant uh, cross-species transplantation is also trying to tell us something, that if we're really good at what we do, we'll ultimately get out of way to utilize even less uh, socially uh, acceptable animals. I don't know how to say that exactly uh, for organ donors. That won't be in the very near future. Finally, our plan is to go back to the IRB with a protocol that allows us to match any baby that comes in here of uh, the right blood type with a panel of baboons so that we can pre-transplant select an important uh, donor for that baby, and then should that baby require transplantation before human heart becomes available, we have the option then to offer a baboon bridge, uh, a biologic bridge to the parents and get the baby to survive. We thought last year about three different times uh, we could have saved babies if we'd had a protocol like this in place. We don't intend to continue to go on like that without a protocol in place. And, and as time goes by and the next five, six years, you're going to see more and more of this kind of contemplation between species. And with that, I'll sit down because Dr. Delion really has the meat of what you want to hear. Hi. I want to start out, first of all, by um, introducing myself as someone who, in his student years, followed with incredible amazement and awe uh, in 1984, and, and since that time, uh, the amazing things that have been done here at Loma Linda University Medical Center, and um, uh, especially in the baby Faye case and other cases of, uh, of allograft transplants for babies, um, I think it's an incredible uh, credit to what uh, ethically conducted uh, uh, perseverance in science can lead to. Um, my job today is to be a little bit more of a contrarian, though. I, um, it's been said that uh, you can't get to the answers if you don't ask the right questions. And I'm going to ask a couple of thorny questions that have come up in this area and not seek to provide answers to them, but maybe to frame the questions in such a way that we can think about them in a different way, perhaps, than what we've done in the past. Um, do, do we have my slides, please? Okay. 
Um, first of all, I, I want to discuss the issue of uh, the ethical issues and xenografts from three different perspectives. Um, what I'm going to do is dive right into a very thorny perspective, and that is the perspective of animal rights activists. And Dr. Bailey has touched on some of uh, their sentiments already, and um, I, I hope to maybe uh, give a different bit of a perspective on uh, where animal rights uh, activism comes from. Secondly, I want to discuss very briefly a perspective from public policy, and third, I want to talk a little bit about research ethics as it relates to xenografts. Um, I start with a brief look at the animal rights movement for several reasons. Animal rights activists in the last 10 or 20 years have commanded an enormous amount of political and social influence and attention, um, disproportionate uh, to their numbers. Many people in the animal rights movement argue that the use of animals for most medical research purposes, including xenografts, is outright wrong, with no further discussion. Um, these arguments made by the animal rights movement have gone from being a very, very uh, out and left field type uh, uh, argument to being more influential. Um, I think it's parallel the concern in our society over the environment, conservation, uh, and in many cases uh, animal rights activists have made allies with uh, those people in these other movements. What I want to do is point out several lessons I've learned as I've studied the animal rights issues. If I could uh, have my first slide, please. Your remote control there is on okay, thanks. Let's see. Great, thanks. Um, discussion of animal rights has to begin with the history of animal welfare. Very briefly, people have worked in an organized way for animal welfare for at least 100 years when the first uh, humane societies were established in Great Britain and the United States. Um, more recently, the Federal Animal Welfare Act in this country has uh, been an expression of animal welfare concerns. Um, this act mandates that research institutions that receive federal funds have animal care and use committees. Another expression of animal welfare is the American Association for Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care. Uh, big uh, set of words there. This provides voluntary certification of institutions that uh, they meet uh, the basic standards set by this body for veterinary care, for health, uh, for humane treatment of animals, and for humane euthanasia of the animals. Um, people active in animal welfare, I think it's important to point out, have never questioned the basic use of animals to serve human ends if done in a humane way. And in fact, I think animal welfare represents a uh, concern that almost uh, everyone in society today has. And uh, in sharp contradistinction to animal welfare concerns uh, is the animal rights movement. And um, I was a bit surprised to learn that uh, the animal rights movement as such, or animal liberation movement as it's called by some, has arisen only in the last 15 year, uh, years or so, very new, um, and has two main philosophical leaders. Um, one of the two leaders uh, in this movement is Peter Singer. And I want to very, very briefly go over his arguments just to demonstrate uh, how he differs from some other uh, philosophies. Uh, he says that all sentient creatures have an interest in not suffering. All interests must be considered in ethically evaluating an action or policy. Equal interests count equally. And that we should always act to maximize the good and minimize the suffering. Um, Tom Regan is the other major philosophical figure uh, in the animal rights movement. Instead of equal interests, as Peter Singer has argued, Tom Regan argues for equal rights. Uh, his argument in brief, an organism which he calls, quote, the subject of a life has inherent value. And I won't read the characteristics of what, what he calls subject of a life and inherent value there. Uh, but organisms with inherent value deserve treatment which respects that value, and we fail to respect a creature's inherent value when we harm that creature. Um, very important distinction between these two philosophers, I think, is that... Uh, Regan, who believes that most mammals would meet these particular criteria, most uh, mammals, certainly most primates, uh, he believes that these creatures are born with these rights, they're inborn rights. Peter Singer doesn't believe in inborn rights. He believes only that, that creatures have an interest in not suffering, that in fact creatures aren't born with rights, that we ascribe rights to them through social conventions like laws, and customs, and traditions. Um, the few points I'd like to make in connection with these two uh, last slides, Singer and Regan have provided a, a big philosophical and financial nucleus about which the animal rights movement has become a politically powerful force lately. Um, both these philosophers claim they're motivated only by a desire to be logically and ethically consistent, not by the idea of sentimental attachment to pets or to animals. Both of them concede that human interests or human rights may be higher than animal interests or animal rights. But even so, animal rights or interests 
can only be ethically overridden in very narrow circumstances, like when a specific human life is in direct and immediate conflict with an animal life. Therefore, they would consider most, but not all, animal involving medical research, and certainly most consumption of meat, as a needless overriding of animal interests or rights in this century. Even though their philosophies disagree, they've made common cause. Uh, both of these uh, leaders want to translate their philosophies into action, and they want to do so specifically by targeting biomedical researchers who are perceived to be more politically and numerically vulnerable. So what, is the, what response has the biomedical research community made to these animal rights arguments? Well, these all come from uh, the animal, or rather the uh, biomedical research literature. This is researchers advising uh, the biomedical community on how should we respond to animal rights movements. Some say promote greater animal welfare, like we are, we're already doing, humane treatment of animals. Some say make sure that no one's pets uh, are rounded up by institutions for use in, in research. Uh, some say exploit this philosophical rift between Singer and Regan and show the, uh, the uh, grassroots animal rights activist what a big philosophical difference there is between these two. Some say ignore animal rights activism altogether, pretend like it doesn't exist to avoid bestowing some sense of legitimacy on animal rights arguments. Uh, and another popular suggestion, uh, politically organize scientists and patients who are beneficiaries of medical research to make their voice heard in Washington. Um, others say confront animal rights activism more aggressively in the media and in popular culture. I think some of these proposals uh, have some merit to them. What I'd like to do here today is briefly make a suggestion of my own, which uh, involves more of a, a basic, uh, uh, maybe a shift in our attitude. I'd like to suggest that, that animals do have interests and that the balancing of these interests is ethically more sound. Well, it's ethically more sound than, than what? I, I believe it's more sound than the alternative belief, which is still very common, that animals have no rights or interests which ever carry weight when compared to the rights or interests of humans, and that humans have the right to any use of animals, no matter how trivial it may be. I, I believe that animals have interests and a degree of moral standing, and that it's based on uh, sentience, purposiveness, capacity to suffer, capacity to form relationships. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that humans possess these qualities in higher measure. There's, I think, no question about that. Um, in fact, even severely handicapped human beings who, who don't have all these characteristics in full measure, I believe are still part of an uh, incredibly large um, interconnected relationship web with family members, with relatives, with the entire human race, and that these relationships are much more complex than those even of the highest animals. I believe that human interests and rights definitely are greater than animal interests and rights, but I still think we have to adopt a conscientious balancing approach that does not fail to at least consider uh, animal interests. What happens when human and animal interests conflict? I believe the true, unavoidable conflict of interest results in what I call moral tragedy. Conflicting interests are daily occurrence, whether it's in the world of politics, uh, biological systems, society, uh, whatever. Uh, balancing harms and benefits is an unavoidable process. And I think good ethics consists of balancing harms and benefits in a just manner. When the balancing of unavoidable conflict of interest results in a creature's suffering, or if its inter interests or rights are being overridden, the result is morally tragic. The degree of moral tragedy obviously varies widely. If the creature is a higher animal capable of suffering, then I think the result is morally tragic nonetheless. So these are the lessons I, I've picked up from studying the animal rights uh, issues, um, except a balancing approach. The tremendous tragedy of a thousand babies or so dying per year of hypoplastic left heart syndrome and countless others of different uh, congenital defects must be balanced against the moral tragedy of a certain number of animals having their interest to be left alone, their interest to uh, remain alive overridden. We may all disagree with each other on the specifics of how to strike this balance. But we have to begin by accepting the necessity of this basic balancing approach. I think that Singer is right to say that both humans and many higher animals like primates can suffer significantly and both have an interest in avoiding suffering. But I disagree with Singer and with uh, animal rights activists that follow him that their interests count equally, that is the interests of, of animals and humans. I firmly believe that the use of some animals in well-conducted research to save human lives is justified by the greater interests of, of human beings. So we should accept the necessity of moral tragedy in certain animal experimentation, but 
we need to seek to minimize the degree of moral tragedy rather than deny its existence. I think it, it's a mistake for uh, biomedical researchers to perform important animal research, uh, even important animal research, while denying that such moral tragedy is occurring or that moral trade-offs are made. Uh, tragedy, I don't think, is necessarily wrong, but we still have to acknowledge its existence. We still create moral tragedy, make moral trade-offs, and our job is to minimize the degree of that tragedy. What I want to do now is shift uh, focus, and, and I'm going to be real brief here because I know we want time for question and answers. Uh, and I'm very interested in some of these issues and specific questions for Dr. Bailey as well. But there's some very potent public policy arguments that are made against uh, or contra pursuing xenograft research, and in fact against uh, expensive uh, or innovative medical procedures in general. And I want to examine some of these. Uh, some say the political cost of fighting animal rights activism is, is going to be very, too high. Um, an argument is made that limited medical and research resources must be used to help more people, and Dr. Bailey touched on, on uh, these arguments. Preventive and lifestyle measures need more attention, especially when it comes to end-stage organ disease that necessitates transplants. Uh, innovative transplant procedures distract from, from these needs, that is public health needs, by focusing on the dramatic and costly rescue of individual identified lives. And uh, another argument that's made that's, that is that in the face of pressing health care needs, expensive medical services like transplantation will inevitably need to be rationed. I think many of these objections are, are important. Um, and to uh, address these objections, this is a brief list of uh, uh, just a representative, uh, not a representative list, but just a, a very quick snapshot of some therapies whose history has included conflict, that is conflict over efficacy and feasibility. Um, stroke rehabilitation, liver transplants, subject of a very uh, protracted battle in the early 1980s over efficacy and feasibility and uh, financial uh, reimbursement. Mass immunizations and screening measures. I think many of us would just assume and seems to us intuitively that these are cost effective and they work, but nonetheless some of them have been questioned. Um, childhood pertussis vaccine is an example. Risk factor intervention counseling, very debatable in some areas as to its efficacy. But I want to focus on kidney transplants for a moment versus uh, chronic hemodialysis. Uh, at one time, kidney transplants were widely believed to be vastly inferior uh, as an option to chronic hemodialysis for patients with end-stage renal disease. Uh, this was because um, it was thought that surgical mortality was too high, immunosuppression, uh, side effects were unknown, graft failure was feared. Um, and uh, now a significant shift uh, has occurred. A lot of data now shows that long-term survival, patient functioning, quality of life of uh, recipients of kidney transplants are all much higher uh, in those patients who are selected properly as candidates for transplant. Um, in fact, over a lifetime, the cost of kidney transplants has even been shown to be lower than the lifetime cost of, of chronic hemodialysis. How do we arrive at that conclusion? How did we figure out that kidney transplants are a better way to go for those people who can, who can undergo kidney transplants? Well, I think the, the answer is pretty simple, by collecting hard data. The current interest in outcomes research, which is one of the hottest new things in medical research, is a direct outgrowth of the need for this type of data. So, I think that one answer to the public policy objections to xenograft research is when assessing the field of xenografts from a public policy perspective, hard data is the only answer to hard choices. Hard data is the only answer to hard choices. Without hard data, no statements can really be made about the need for rationing, the necessity for small or large-scale animal organ use, or the responsibility of society to fund a certain medical service. Um, if we accept that the death of a thousand infants per year from hypoplastic left heart syndrome is morally tragic, that we should try to do something about it, and that the balancing of animal-human interests allows us to use animal organs and attempt to save their lives, then we must condone ethically conducted research to determine efficacy and feasibility. Will xenografts eventually develop, like kidney transplants, into a cost-effective, beneficial, life-saving treatment? If animal organs are used on a large scale as bridge procedures to buy time for patients to receive a definitive uh, allograft, like Dr. Bailey mentioned, will they buy enough time? Will the human organ shortage be corrected enough so that these patients can ever hope to get a human organ? Or will xenografts follow the path of the artificial heart? Many of you are familiar with the history of the artificial heart, which initially showed enormous uh, early promise, but which has not fulfilled that promise due to huge scientific, technological, and administrative roadblocks. I think that we may be much closer to the answers to these questions because of some research, especially done here at Loma Linda, but the final answers aren't in yet. Um, 
after efficacy and feasibility have been demonstrated experimentally, then our society must make an ethical and reasoned judgment about the extent, extending the role of this particular expensive therapy in the context of other pressing healthcare needs. Xenografts will at that time have to compete on the basis of hard data with other uh, therapies and other healthcare needs. But until then, I believe that the need for hard data mandates research. And that brings me to my uh, last uh, section, research ethics. What is the, uh, what is the status of xenografts in humans? Um, some people insisted, uh, in fact many critics of Dr. Bailey have said that xenografts uh, in, the, in their early history had been performed purely to demonstrate feasibility, to accumulate general knowledge, knowledge about immunology, rejection, and graft survival, but that uh, xenografts have not been performed primarily for the benefit of the patient in question. Uh, many others defend xenografts by classifying them as therapeutic experimentation, that is experiments done with every intention of benefit to the patient and with a reasonable chance of benefiting the patient, but in a context of collecting urgently needed research data as well. And I think that uh, I agree with the latter view, um, especially in the case of bridge procedures done to buy time for a patient awaiting a, a human organ. Uh, this has features both of pure research but of also of therapeutic experimentation. Why does this matter? Why should we be discussing where on the research continuum xenografts are now? Well, I think for one primary reason, and that's because different consent requirements apply to different kinds of research. Different consent requirements apply if, it's some, if an experiment is being done as pure research, if it has therapeutic intent, if it's innovative therapy, or if it's proven or conventional therapy. To deal ethically with patients means obviously to be very clear about the research status of procedures or of interventions proposed to them. The closer a treatment is to pure research and the more vulnerable a patient is, the more challenging it becomes to ensure what we call informed consent in that patient. Let me... And here, I just want to illustrate a, a spectrum of, of what I call patient vulnerability. And you might ask, vulnerability to what? Um, I think candidates for, for any kind of medical research or therapeutic experiment or, or innovative therapy can be described as more or less vulnerable to suggestion, to misunderstanding of information, to feelings of helplessness within a medical system in the context of their being very, very ill. Um, some examples of, of very vulnerable patients, I think, are, are the incompetent, or prisoners and institutionalized patients, terminally ill patients, uh, critically ill or desperate patients, children and minors uh, uh, for whom surrogates make decisions. The poor and uninsured could perhaps be viewed as, as vulnerable. Um, this is why the President's Commission and other uh, medical ethics guidelines have always warned strongly against the use of prisoners or institutionalized patients in medical research. Many of the uh, worst examples of abuses in research have occurred with patient populations such as the incompetent or prisoners. Um, if studies of equal research value can be performed on less vulnerable patients, then our ethical obligation is to use those less vulnerable subjects. I don't mean to imply here that it's always less ethical to enroll experimental subjects who are critically ill, institutionalized, poor, children, or unrepresentative of the population. In fact, many times we have to enroll those patients because they are the targets of what we want to do. But I do mean to say that ethically conducted medical research often involves a very delicate balancing act. Vulnerable patients deserve special, painstaking, rigorous, special attention to informed consent, while at the same time extending to them also, if possible, the therapeutic benefits of research and innovative therapy. It's precisely these most vulnerable patients or their surrogates whose protection is most important. In fact, and Dr. Bailey can answer this question better than I, are there ever patients or parents of patients uh, who are sick enough to need an animal organ transplants who aren't supremely vulnerable? I mean, can you even be that sick and not be vulnerable? Um, is there vulnerability ever correctable by even the most thorough, most conscientious consent process? Maybe not, I'm not sure. But even if true informed consent is a lofty, maybe even an unreachable goal uh, I th in a patient this vulnerable, I'm convinced that we have to keep striving to attain it. And so basically in summary, I, what I've learned from animal rights, I think is an approach that involves balancing of interests is most helpful. I think that we can learn an appreciation of moral tragedy and uh, continue our determination to diminish moral tragedy. I think in the area of public policy arguments, that hard data is the only answer to hard choices, and that calls for more research conducted in an ethical way. Uh, research ethics, I think that the status of xenografts in humans is that of a therapeutic experiment. It's not pure research. It's not proven therapy. 
Um, I think because of that, each patient's consent process must be sensitive to the clinical status of the treatment that's offered, that is a therapeutic experiment, and the extreme vulnerability of the patient, which, which may be an irremediable vulnerability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Drs. Bailey and DeLeon. I'm going to invite you to join me here at the table, and we have questions. If you have to leave, please exit out the back door, and please don't exit out the front door. Who has the first question for us? I would like to ask one then. Um, it seems to me that there is an agreement that we should speak in terms of the balancing of interests. Dr. DeLeon spoke that way in his paper, and the last slide that Dr. Bailey had on his presentation showed the little baby outweighing all of these primates. So there was some balancing going on. Now I take it that a balancing of interest approach is different from two other approaches, one of which would call for the view that animals have no interests or rights whatsoever, and on the other hand, a kind of ecological egalitarianism, which would say animals have interests and rights that are equal to those of humans. So I take it that both Drs. Bailey and De Leon are together in this middle third approach. But is that just a nice way of saying we're going to do what we want to do anyway? When it really comes down to any difficult decision, can either of you imagine any circumstance in which the interests or rights, let's not get into the Singer-Reagan debate right now, the interests or rights of any animal or cluster of animals could even in principle outweigh those of one human being? Uh, personally, I don't think so in the area of of what we're talking about here in the context of xenograft transplants. Um, what I guess, stepping back for a minute, um, I think that what I was arguing for is more uh, getting people on board the idea of uh, acknowledging animal interests. That is, that there is even anything to balance at all. And I think that the fact that Dr. Bailey showed a slide that showed a, a lever with the balancing involved um, shows that, that most of us do agree, like you said, on, on that. So uh, that was my primary point. Now, would that ever lead us uh, to, uh, to reject um, animal use in a xenograft context? I don't think so. I think that, um, I think that probably the, the balancing of interest approach is more applicable to research that is very, very indirectly beneficial. Um, a lot of animal rights uh, activists criticize, for example, the, the LD50 uses of animals in, in drug tests uh, or um, testing of cosmetics, that kind of thing. Those kind of uh, uses in, in science or in testing, I think, are much more vulnerable to the, to the uh, balancing of interest argument. Okay. Dr. Bailey? <clears throat> That's where I get from my arm. Back off here. Well, uh, Dr. Delion is a hard act to follow, and I should probably just shut up. <laughs> uh, if you take anything away from here, you'll take away many of the good words that he's uh, shared with you and thoughts. And when it boils down finally to surgeons who tend to be more pragmatic uh, on some of these issues, uh, I look at it in a very simplistic way. What if the roles were reversed? If I drop into a creek in the Amazon, it's full of piranhas, I'll be eaten. <laughs> That's pretty. Uh, they don't have a, an ethics committee decide first where they should eat me. <laughs> they just help themselves to my toes and knees and everything else. And, and if one will look at the, uh, at the various species that are around our planet, uh, they all act in much the same way. It has to do with preservation of their own species. And I have, as Dr. Delian and all of you here do, a certain commitment to my own species. And so that makes sense to me somehow. If I really get stuck, I'll ask my 12-year-olds whether we're doing the right thing. And, and you can do that. Go ask your 5-year-old whether it's a reasonable thing to compassionately sacrifice an animal to save a human baby. And um, you'll get a variety of, uh, of questions back from that. But in the end, uh, at least in my household, it's come back that they uh, tentatively support this. <laughs> uh, they're not influenced with all the history like I am, and so uh, why not ask somebody that has a fresh uh, attitude, namely the children of the world, and, uh, 
And I suspect on balance the children would support it in the context that uh, Dr. DeLeon has placed it for you. They won't allow me to get away with wholesale murder of animals, however. I wouldn't be able to go home and face them if we were doing that sort of thing or if we were abusing animals. All I would have to bring home is some video that showed I bonked an animal on the head, and I would lose my children in the process. And so I'm keen that they are with me on this. They're a pretty good guide as to where we're going, and your children will be uh, for you, too. I have a question with respect to a public policy sort, but first, Dr. Miller uh, from the University of California at Irvine. I just wanted to look at another dimension of uh, need for balancing, which is very similar to the point you made, Dennis, about the need to balance the potential for success against the, um, the risks and the, and the cost. Um, and it, it seems to me at least as major a question in xenographing at this point in time as the question of balancing animal versus human rights is the question of balancing the infant's rights against the rights of the family. And I appreciate that this must always be a tension in uh, the care of such, uh, uh, of such children. I wonder what further thoughts either of you may have about it. I think that um, I, I really had to breeze through uh, part of that issue of likelihood of, of success and, and didn't get a chance to, to comment on that uh, for time reasons, but I, I think that you're, you're uh, dead on right about, uh, about that. The likelihood of success, I think, is, is morally relevant in that um, it's, part of, it's part of the ideal informed consent process. That is, um, desperate parents, let's say, of an infant um, who are willing to, to clutch it at any straw uh, that would give them hope for, for survival of their infant. I think, you know, not only are they vulnerable, as I said, but um, they also, uh, I think they're subject to, to believing that there's more hope than there actually may be. And um, that's basically, there's nothing that anyone can do about it. There's nothing Dr. Bailey can, can do about that. That's just the way that it's going to be. But I think that, that our response to that should be to try as much as possible, realizing that it's probably impossible to completely do this, but as much as possible, um, disabuse them of any false hopes that they may have. And that has to be based on a likelihood of success, of which uh, Dr. Bailey can comment. Well, uh, I don't know that I have an answer for you exactly, but all parents of dying babies are desperate. There is no real solution to this uh, dilemma that you've pointed out. Uh, most would like their babies to live. Most would at least like some hope that their babies might live. And even the hope itself is almost worth clinging to. But they're asked to make uh, terribly important decisions about all other asset, uh, aspects of their children's care and welfare and feeding and where they go to school and how they might relate to uh, philosophy and all those other things. They're asked to participate in all that, so they have to participate in the, in the question of whether or not their baby should live or die or whether anything at all should be done. And so they're asked uh, to make that decision, and some choose to do nothing. And there's one cluster uh, in England where most, you know, with some fairly vigorous counseling, most parents choose not to do anything. Now, of course, they have to live with that later, too. They, they made that choice. I'm reminded, uh, I got to know the... Uh, the uh, head of the FBI, um, and his wife, 25 years ago, had a baby with total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage that died during surgery in Houston, 25 years ago. And she could not relate that information to me without breaking down and crying, 25 years later. These parents are going to have to live with their decisions 25 years later. Uh, what if we had agreed to have something done for this child? And then all those options are put out there, and we ask them to make this impossible decision. Most, however, I think, uh, if it's laid out fairly, will tend to choose hope over nothing. Uh, Dr. Walters, please. Uh, I think the basic justification for use of uh, animal organs for saving babies, for instance, uh, is that uh, we humans have greater sentience than do baboons or chimpanzees. Isn't that right, basically? What if, uh, this is sort of a mind experiment, what if there were extraterrestrials that came to Earth 
And the gap between humans and those ETs was even greater than that between humans and chimpanzees or baboons. Would it be morally justifiable for those ETs to use humans in an analogous way for their benefit that we use baboons or chimpanzees? Just for those who may not have heard the question, the, uh, uh, those on the tape, listening to the tape, the question is if there are species of beings who have intelligences that are uh, as much greater than our own as ours are greater than those of the primates, would they be justified in using us for organ donation? It's the threshold question, and uh, it's, I think it's an important question. I'd like to hear both of you respond to that. You're going to make me go first, huh? I think that, um, first of all, I think, you know, obviously, by the nature of your question, you're going to make me answer without recourse to uh, a Christian worldview or Christian uh, ethics. And I think that's fair when, when we're arguing about this in a uh, secular arena. Um, if, if you believe that... Uh, First of all, I think it's it's arguable that sentience uh, is, or, or some degree of sentience, there should be a, some bright line somewhere that separates creatures who cannot ever be used as means towards other people's ends or other creatures' ends. Um, whether or not that that's a bright line that we could we could argue forever about where if we can draw that such a line and and where it should be drawn. Um, one answer uh, to that might be the might makes right. Uh, solution, and that is, like Dr. Bailey said, uh, you have a bias towards your own species. Um, most animals, like piranhas in the Amazon uh, River, have a bias towards their own species, and if they can have the, if they have the capability to make use of a, another species for their own ends, then then uh, they may do so. And in a world uh, without um, some more uh, structured traditional. Uh, ethics to fall back on, such as a Christian ethics or some other uh, uh, religious or non-secular ethic. Uh, I think that that argument uh, at least has to be heard, that the might makes right uh, solution. Well, when different uh, subpopulations, sub the human species, raise up and consider themselves slightly better than the rest of us, um, we deal with that. And uh, maybe there'd be enough Martians to do us in, but not without a fight. And so it's a, yeah, that's what a fertile mind Jim Walters has up there. Think of it. <laughs> kind of, I'm stumped on that one, really. Uh, I'd love to meet the Martian. That would almost be worth uh, giving one organ up somewhere <laughs> just to meet those guys. <laughs> I'm going to withdraw my year-end contribution to NASA, however. <laughs> But it's been a long time since any thoughtful person of any tradition, religious or secular, who has seriously said, might makes right. The last one I can think of who said that was uh, Thrasymachus in Plato's Dialogue. Now that's a, that's a hell of a long time ago. Uh, so for us to, to, for us to say might makes right seriously is, is I think, um, dancing on a moral issue of profound importance and playing a joke with it. Okay, very good. No, I don't, I don't believe that, seriously. <laughs> I, I really don't. And uh, let me tell you why. I think that, I think that um, let me use slavery as, uh, an, as an example that, that may not answer your question perhaps, but uh, tell you how I feel about this. I think that at one time, uh, using other people of, say, another ethnic background uh, as, as slaves, that is, as uh, means towards your own end, was intuitively accepted. That is, um, uh, there, were, uh, there were, certainly were movements in slave-holding societies that said, oh, you should treat your slaves well. You, in other words, kind of like the animal welfare movement, analogous to that, that you should be kind to them, you should treat them justly, etc. But that their basic uh, function was still that, and that is, as means towards your end. And uh, I, I think it was... Um, uh, probably uh, arguments along the lines of, and, and I, I hate to be uh, lumped in there as a disciple or anywhere even in the same breath as, as Peter Singer, uh, but I think that it was arguments similar to his that led to our realizing that, hey, even though intuitively for centuries or for millennia uh, this use of human beings was accepted, uh, nonetheless there's no reason to count one human being suffering as any more important or less important than any other human being. So there's no morally relevant differences between a black human being, a white human being, a brown human being, etc. Um, 
that would be my my only response. Dr. Bailey, do you want to respond? Uh, uh, hardly. <laughs> <laughs> Shows you how smart I am. I thought Arthur said that to the Knights of the Round Table, <laughs> and he lost Guinevar. So I have, I have nothing much to do with that argument philosophically. I'll let you deal. With it. One more question. Oh, uh, Mr. Sackland is saying we have to stop. Thank you all. Thank you, Drs. Bailey and DeLeon. It's been fun having you here. Really?